start off, I'm Robert Moss, I'm a food writer. I've written a book called Barbecue, the History of American Institution, which is uh, one of the things I wrote about in there was hash, uh, which is a unique, uh, unique thing. And as we'll talk a little bit about the history of hash, and then Sam, I'll let you introduce yourself. We're talking about hash, and usually when I talk about hash with people, um, they don't know what I'm talking about, because if you're not from South Carolina, you've probably never heard of it. I think being in Greenwood is a little bit intimidating, because people here probably know an awful lot about hash. Yeah, I call, it, I call this a hash. It, it, it absolutely is. And I thought I'd start a little bit about where hash came from originally, um, and, and the history behind it, because um, it, it it's something that is, is and I'm really excited that the festival is, is, is focusing on hash because it's so entrenched in this area. In fact, if you go back and look, um, you know, I've done a lot of historical research on the history of barbecue and, and everything related to it, and the earliest references to hash I've ever been able to find, uh, in a, in a hash as we call it, not corned beef hash or something like that, but, but with the hash cooked in iron pots, is from the 1850s. And it's actually from Abbeville, South Carolina, which are these. these Probably can't read these, but these are two two newspaper descriptions of a barbecue, of, of barbecues and additives. I think one's 1854, one's 1858. Uh, this is brief mention to talk about uh, there is delightful beef steaks and rich hash in one of the barbecues, and in the other one there is the ten, tenderest and fattest mutton, nicest barbecue pig, smoking hash, Irish potatoes, and a couple other things. So hash is just very mentioned very briefly uh, here in Advil. And then I did a little map. Uh, of sort of the how hash spread, at least from newspapers, from what I could find back in, in the old days, and it sort of goes from from uh, orange to, to blue. So this this is Abbeville in 1850s, which is the first reference I'm able to find. And then the yellow is you get the Newberry and Aiken, sort of spread, a little light orange there, 1860s, 1870s, and then it starts to make its way down to Augusta around the 1880s, 1890s, uh, up to Lawrence. And then by the early 20th century, hash, like barbecue hash, it actually made its way all the way up to Chester, uh, up near, near Rock Hill, and all the way down to almost to Swainsboro, uh, I think it's Pondicherry, a small little town in Georgia that uh, there's hash at barbecues down there. And so really, this is the hotbed of what you call hash. Uh, and it really took off, in, particularly in Augusta later, but right here in, in Greenwood, uh, is, is the birthplace of what we know as barbecue hash. Um, and where hash actually came from is out of the old uh, hog killing traditions. And uh, from what we can, you know, from what I can tell, uh, it actually, there's a, a word hazlet, or sometimes pronounced hazlet, which is from uh, Middle English and then from French, which really means the, the entrails of a, of a, of a pig. Uh, and sometimes you'll see Haslet hash in some old accounts, or sometimes it's written Hashlet, uh, and that, you see that a lot. And it's usually accounts of, of hog killings. You also might see liver and lights hash, lights being an old term for lungs, uh, or hog head hash. So what all this has in common is it's the pieces of the pig that you really you know, can't do much else with, but uh, at hog killing time, it's all about a way to use every bit of, of the pig that, that you could. Um, so, uh, you know, this is an old, the first recipe I've actually found for a hog head hash, very similar to what you might, might think of today. You boil the head until it falls apart, chop the meat up, put it in with uh, uh, salt and black pepper to taste and one, one large onion uh, for each quart of, of the meat. And you cook until the uh, onion is well done and it's not uh, sloppy, which I think is a good description of, of hash. Now this is, this is more the kind of thing that we cooked uh, during a hog killing. You know, this, is, this is actually a recipe that's, that it's actually accompanied by, a previous, right before it is a recipe for dry rice, which is the low country way of, of cooking rice, so each gra grain stands out. So hash and rice is, you know, this is actually used from the 20s, 1920s is the recipe you can find. Um, there's actually, a, in, in uh, England, there's haslet there is actually, uh, this is a picture of it, it is more like what we might call liver pudding, but it's uh, a, a sort of cold meatloaf made from all those organ meats uh, coming out of that tradition. So I think it really came from England, the, the term itself and, and the tradition of using the innards of pigs is, is sort of led to what we call hash. Is that different from like sows? It's, it's all similar, but it's just what you do with it. Yeah, and how fine do you chop it up? But it's all ways of using the, the leftover pieces and parts in different ways of either 
making a stew out of it, or in the case of like sauce or liver pudding, sort of molding it and making this loaf kind of type of thing out of it. Yeah, Scrapple in, in Pennsylvania Dutch area, very, very similar. But for the early days, like the very first reference I've been able to find to, to hash, it's associated with barbecues. They, they've always sort of gone together. Um, and there's a reason for that. And these are some old pictures of barbecues. This is one down in Georgia, 19th century. Most of the pictures are obviously from the early 20th century, but the, up until you know, up until the World War II, these old outdoor barbecues are all cooked the same way. And what you'll see is these, they're whole, an, old, whole hogs, or whole animals, not just hogs, um, sort of split, laid on these metal rods over a, a, a deep trench with coals and, and cooked. So it's an outdoor tradition. And if you look at these, one of the things you'll notice, it's not just one or two. These are huge events. Like this one, you should see how far back the pits go. So these are massive outdoor events that have thousands and thousands of people attending. And that was one of the biggest forms of media celebration uh, back in the, the 19th century. So why did hash become so associated with barbecue? Well, because in the old days, uh, barbecue was also a hog killing or a sheep killing, whatever it was. Because these days before refrigeration, there's no way to keep meat cold. You couldn't just go buy you know, pork shoulders or ribs or anything like that. They would actually, these, these are usually free public events, a community celebration, 4th of July was a huge time for barbecues in the South in the 19th century. Local farmers would donate whatever livestock they had on hand, um, which is why we, we think of pork in this part usually as, as, or barbecue in these parts usually as pork today. But as you saw with some of the early ones, mutton is very common, or, or sheep, or lamb, or goats, uh, and even beef every now and again would show up on the pits. But they'd actually bring the animals to wherever the barbecue was going to, was going to be, which is usually outside of town, somewhere in a shady grove. You'll see the trees there in the shade, usually near spring for water. And they'd actually butcher the, the animals right there. So you would have the whole animal uh, there. You put the you know, the, the bulk of it would go on the barbecue pits to cook, but the rest you put in pots like these uh, in order to make hash. So from the very early days, people would make hash both during a uh, hog killing, but also they would make they make it in a barbecue as a way to use up all the pieces and parts that you, you couldn't put on the pit. Um, it's actually, the hash is very similar to a bunch of other, or several other sort of classic barbecue stews. Uh, this is uh, actually Burgoo, Kentucky, which is often made with sheep or mutton. So they look very, very similar to, to these types of pots. And these are actually Brunswick stew uh, photos in, in Georgia. So same idea though, same, same pots down there. Brunswick stew has an interesting history, a little bit of a debate between Virginia and Georgia about where Brunswick stew comes from. Uh, Virginia claims it, and then Georgia not only claims it, but they have this real specific piece of evidence. This is down, uh, Right off of Saint, uh, little, little, like rest area park kind of thing, right near Saint Simon's Island, down in, in right in Brunswick, Georgia, and it claims in this pot the first Brunswick stew was made on Saint Simon's Isle, July 2nd, 1898. So they claimed it to be the first Brunswick stew, and a lot of people think Georgia invented it, um, which is great. They've got a pot, but it might have been the first Brunswick stew made on Saint Simon's Island, but it was by no means the first Brunswick stew ever. Uh, Virginia actually owns owns that title. This is a, a, a article from the 1850s from Virginia, Saint, uh, from Petersburg, Virginia, uh, describing uh, Brunswick stew back then, uh, a good 50 or so years before the, the pot claims. Uh, in that case, it's uh, Brunswick stew is uh, originally with squirrels, though chicken would do if you have squirrels available, added with uh, sufficient quantity of water and set to stewing uh, and, and adding to, uh, tomatoes, corn, butter beans, potatoes, and the requisite condiments of salt, meat, and cayenne pepper. So, Brunswick stew actually developed sort of like a hunting stew. It was a squirrel stew that was developed in, in the south side of Virginia. The best we can tell, 1820s, 1830s, is sort of evolved. And Virginia has a huge outdoor stew tradition. So that people, you know, so Virginia claims it, Georgia claims it, but I think it's actually an interesting distinction because Virginia Brunswick stew is not a lot like Georgia Brunswick stew. And uh, same thing with North Carolina. This is actually two pictures. One on the left is, uh, is Brunswick stew, I think, in the heavies, uh, which is down uh, between uh, between Augusta and Atlanta, off of I-26 in Crawfordsville. On the right is from Carolina barbecue up in North Carolina. So you can see one, that these are two very different uh, types of stew. They both have corn and, and, some, and tomato in them, but the one on the left is cooked way, way down. And Georgia Bar Brunswick stew tends to be like hash in its consistency, it just has more stuff in it, like like 
tomatoes and corn. Whereas in other parts, especially North Carolina, Tennessee, you'll find this brunch of stew. It's almost like a soup. You know, it's real, real chunky. Now I'm convinced that. Uh, yep, I am actually convinced that the, that Brunswick stew, as it's called in Georgia, is actually more closely related to South Carolina hash than it is to the Virginia Brunswick stew. The Virginia Brunswick stew is a hunting stew with squirrel. But if you read this actual description, this is from Macon, Georgia in the 1920s, uh, describing uh, how to make Brunswick stew. Uh, the, the fundamental ingredients, the basis of Brunswick stew is what is known as hazlet of the hog, uh, which is the, the heart, uh, liver, lights, kidneys, the goozle, whatever that is, uh, head and feet of the hog, whose carcass browns and drips grease fitfully on the, on the red embers of the pit. On top of this hazlet is dumped tomatoes, corn, English peas, beans, and, and uh, onions, peppers, and other such things. So it's really like a hash was, which is the hazlet or the, the, the organ meat of the, of the hog, and then with all the other stuff on it, and still cooked down. So it's best. So I really think there's more similarities between those two than there is with the actual old squirrel stew that you would find up in Virginia. I think somehow the name came down there for, for stew. Um, Nevertheless, by the time uh, the early 20th century, hash was all over this, this part. Uh, and you know, this 2,500 pounds of hash for a Board of Commerce barbecue was cooked uh, down. This is, these are from, from Augusta. And what's interesting is on the menus here, there's uh, barbecue lamb, barbecue pork, barbecue hash, and, and giblet hash, which is a form made with chicken uh, giblets, so a, a little different style of hash. But what's interesting is you see mutton on a lot of these menus. Uh, very common to see mutton in barbecue in this, these areas, all the way down to Augusta at this time. The one on the right here was cooked by a man named Clem Castleberry. And if the name Castleberry rings a bell uh, with you, it's actually, uh, he was like one of the most you know, in-demand barbecue guys from down in Augusta. And everybody liked his hash so much that he started canning it. And so this is actually, on the left is, a, is an ad for Castleberries from 1920. Others are doing the same thing. This is Spiller's Cannery, which is down in Georgia somewhere. But you'll see this. He can barbecue pig, barbecue hash, Brunswick stew, and Irish stew. So you have your, your, your two stews there together. Now Castleberry went ahead, went, went on, you know, they um, founded, a, made a big factory in Augusta. Uh, and their original product was Castleberry's uh, famous Georgia hash. It was the first canned product. Um, Castleberries are still around today. It got sold at some point to Bumblebee, the tuna company, and then they got in trouble with some kind of botulism scandal, and now some company in, Jer in New Jersey owns it. So Castleberries are still in the market. You can still buy the running stew, but they don't sell canned hash anymore. Uh, and it's made up in, in New Jersey somewhere. They, the Augusta plant shut down uh, about, 10, about 10 years ago. But it all goes back to, uh, to Augusta and, and hash. Um, hash made its way into Meat markets, these are ads from the 20s. Uh, a lot of them are in Augusta, uh, Bahari's restaurant up in Columbia in the 1940s was serving hash and rice. So as barbecue restaurants developed in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, hash and rice sort of made the leap from an outdoor, uh, either hog killing or outdoor barbecue stew to something that became a commercial product. And it's been that way ever since. And so this is actually uh, Jackie Heights down in Leesville. Uh, cooking hash starts off on the left in the big iron, huge iron pots. In their case, um, no one, well, not, well, not no one, few people still are using the organ meat in hash these days. It's really rare, rare to find that, at least in restaurants. Uh, like at, at Heights, they start with the inexpensive cuts of pork, like pork shoulder, and they actually put some beef in there too, onions and other things, and, and then they cook it all the way down, you know, with mustard sauce. So you'll find hash. This is actually, I think, uh, this is a cannon, it's a little mountain. So the yellow, you know, they put a lot of that yellow mustard base or mustard sauce in, in the hash. Uh, this is uh, Midway Barbecue up in Union, which is an all beef hash. So you'll find that, particularly the further west you go, the more beef uh, makes it sway in the pot. It's not, not a great picture, but it captures the, the brown hash. And then this is all the way down uh, near me in, in Charleston. This is Messenger's Barbecue, which is a mustard based barbecue sauce. But the hash is red. They put a lot of tomato in it. It's really tasty too. So you'll see a lot of different varieties around in restaurants today, uh, and it all dates back to really this part of South Carolina and back to the barbecues back before the Civil War. Uh, you know, as best we can tell. So that's sort of how it got from the the outdoor hog killing and the barbecue to the, to the restaurants. And I understand it's done a lot on how it also went to mill towns and. and the hash houses and other places from there. So well, that's so interesting, you know.
nobody's dug in the hash very much, but when I did the Carolina hash documentary, um, we got some uh, cultural geographers together who were at odds about where the hash lines were in South Carolina. And it was interesting. And we shot a little video of them, and they were really pulling them against each other. But this one man named Pillsbury uh, got really interested in the hash documentary, and I had him as a commentator. And he had dug up letters from the French Huguenots not long after the settling of Charleston. And he found a, a letter in which a French Huguenot was writing back to his relatives in provincial France. And the Hazlitts mm -hmm. and things like that were what they were cooking in their black pots back over there. And this man wrote and he said, um, um, I have seen Negroes cooking what appears to be the same haslet that we cook in France. And what they cook it from is that they're given the poor heart parts of the hog on the plantations. And they're told to make something tasty that the slaves could eat. And they were very creative. A lot of these African uh, cooks came uh, over from Africa with, with uh, a lot of herbs and spices. And so they, they began cooking the, 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 these parts down into, uh, you know, into kind of a, a, a mother. And then they pull it out and they take, take the, the bones out of it. And then they would chop it up and reintroduce it to the pot and add water and onions and spices and things like that. So he was reporting on this and he, he said, uh, I would call this a hashiers, H-A-S-H-I-E-R-S, which is a French Huguenot term. And so I found that to be very interesting. Um, and then I went down to the Indian Field Camp Meeting. Anybody know about those camp meetings down in the lower part of the state? They're 300 years old. And uh, they still go to them every summer. Uh, they, 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 uh, they wouldn't tent sit in a big circle. And the families in the, in the uh, days when farming was going on, they, they'd have lay-by, and then they would uh, they'd, they'd go to these camp meetings for a week. Everything would shut down. If the schools were running, the schools would close. The kids would come out, and they'd camp out there at these religious gatherings for a week. Now, there are five camp meetings within 35 miles radius of St. George, South Carolina. There are two of them that are black. And there are three of them that are white. The, the African American origins of, of those camp meetings really were derivative from the early Methodist camp meetings that were begun by uh, an old, old Methodist uh, uh, horseback evangelist who rode through he, he planted the seeds for them. And then they were maintained. And they, and they, they, they Never ever not met. Every year they, they, they hold their camp meeting. And um, so when I moved back down from from uh, northern Virginia to South Carolina, I was taking come down to take care of my mom and uh, I began working with the McKissick Folklife Museum at the University of South Carolina. And uh, there's a guy there named Jay Williams, and Jay had worked with me on my very first film. I'd been a filmmaker in New York, and I was invited to come back down to South Carolina and teach filmmaking in schools in Greenville in 1972. 
and uh, we were very successful. We, we produced uh, 83 films made by elementary, junior, and senior high school kids, and we had a big festival for those films. The director of the South Carolina Arts Commission came up to me afterwards and he says, I want you to come work at the South Carolina Arts Commission as filmmaker in residence. I love film. South Carolina needs film because it's a storytelling state and we need we need to get it started. So I said, well I gotta I gotta film this for the first time in a film festival in New York and I, I don't know if I could move to South Carolina. What kind of filmmaking do you have down there? And he said, well that's that's what I want you to do. I want you to establish some sort of film center where filmmakers in South Carolina can produce works that are local. So I, 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 I said, well, what do we need? I said, well, you need $65,000 worth of cameras, a $35,000 eight plate editing machine, and uh, lights. And that kind of equipment is going to be real expensive. So he, he had called a meeting of the board of directors at the Arts Commission, and he came out and he said, well, I've called Nancy Hatch up at the National Endowment for the Arts, and they're very interested in getting this kind of thing happening around the country. And they said they would pay half the price of the cost of the equipment if we could match it, and my commissioners have said we would match it. Well, my, you know, my bones are South Carolina. I was born here. My, my people were, were farmers in Williston, South Carolina. And so I, I decided to come back down here. And I built a film center for filmmakers. And But the promise that I made to the director of the Arts Commission was, he said, he said, I want you to make a film that every person in South Carolina could enjoy that would teach them what independent filmmaking was, because that was what was happening in New York when I was up there. Equipment was being made of a scale that, a, that an artist like me could take a camera and make his own film, and there were a lot of filmmakers doing that in New York City. And so when I moved down here, I realized that that movement was, was occurring and that there was no reason why South Carolina didn't have filmmakers and that we needed to try to find them and help them get with this equipment, help fund their films. <coughs> well, the director said, I, I, it took me about four years to get this center set up. One day he came in and he said, Mr. Woodward, you've got to go make a film like you promised you would do. And so you've got a staff now that can run this center, and I want you to I want you to, to uh, I want you to uh, to go out and make it. Well I couldn't figure out what to do, so I, I started going to breakfasts all around uh, all around Columbia. One morning I was in this diner and I just noticed that everybody in that diner was eating grits. And this was after integration. There was blacks and whites and you know, and, and the, the people who were going down to the state house were there, you know, and the women who were waiting for the department stores to open on Main Street were there. So I sat there for two hours and I, I, I said to myself, I'm going to leave whenever somebody doesn't order grits. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, 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 I looked at my watch and I had to get back up to the Arts Commission, but there was this fellow sitting at the counter, and this was no Art Deco counter, you know, it had black onyx and chrome, remember those old places, spinning seats. That, this fellow had the craziest looking plate of grits I'd ever seen. It was pale gray yellow, and it was floating over the, the sides of the plate. What he had done is he'd gotten bacon and sausage and biscuits and he had cut them all up in, in, in grits, put a lot of butter on them. So I walked up to him and sat down and I said, Sir, I, I'm really interested in that plate of grits. What, what, what all is in that plate of grits? He just kept eating. And I said, Sir, I'm thinking maybe I might make a film about grits. 
how do you like to eat your grits? I kept eating. And I said, sir, I'd like to know the most unusual way you've ever eaten grits or heard of anybody eating grits. So the guy, like, <laughs> it would be like this, you know. We're sitting real close together. So he looks over at me like this, looks me in the eye, and he says, where are you from? <laughs> and I said, uh, I was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina. He said, do they eat grits in Spartanburg? And I said, yes, sir. He said, then why you got to ask me about grits? <laughs> and he reached up and he pulled a napkin out of the, the uh, napkin tray, and he took a ball point pen out and wrote this guy's name down. He said, you call him, and he'll talk to you to your blue in the face about grits. <laughs> He puts peanut butter on his grits every morning for breakfast. Now leave me alone, let me finish my <laughs> Well, I knew I had my film. That was the film. If I had my camera right there, that would have been the first shot in the film. So I ran back up and I told Jay Williams, uh, the arts I found my film. It's called Grits. And he says, oh, it's great. I said, but I got to shoot it. The old man that I worked for up in New York said, if you ever get an idea for a film, and you don't go buy a roll of film to shoot the first three minutes of it, you'll never make it. So I went back down to that same diner, and uh, I knew the, the uh, lady who was the head cook, her name was Annie. And so I went back, and I, the whole scene had changed about lunchtime. I went back and I said, Annie, you've got to come out. i got to do an interview with you. And I said, what kind of interview? I said, well, I've decided I'm going to make a film about bread. So let's take a minute. She said, well, I'm getting lunch ready. And I said, well, I'm going to be up against the building outside. So she came out and she was wiping her hands on an apron. And, and I said, Annie, what time do you get here in the morning and start cooking grits? She said, 4 o'clock. I said, when do you stop serving grits? And she said, well, we don't. Not until people stop asking for them. And so I said, well, thank you. And that was the first, first shot in the film. So I went ahead and made the It's Grits movie, and it took off like a rocket. It showed over PBS, and I had no idea that it would, it would go as, as far as, as it did. But it told me something. It told me that if you use food as the doorway through which you move into the South, it's going to push every, uh, everything else aside. Race, politics, religion, they're going to all melt away because of one theme that everybody has in their life in the South is the great food that they love. And once you're inside that food door and you start talking to people about their food, they are the most real people you'll ever capture on food. And so, I spent most of my career shooting Southern culture and folk life documentaries. And, uh, and the one that I brought with me today, oddly enough, ties in directly to what you were talking about. It's shot in Abbeville, South Carolina. And I was, uh, I was at, a, uh, uh, at a conference in, in Columbia, and this, this folklorist walked up and he said, uh, I hear you shooting a documentary about Carolina Hash, and I said, I am. He said, well, you've got to go to Abbeville and find Walt Wilson. He's the best upstate hash master that I've ever tasted the hash with. And so, towards the end of the film, I got up and I went and I, I went to shoot that film in, in Abbeville. And I'm going I'm to show it to you here. And it encapsulates in a, in, a, in a capsule the whole story of, of, of hash and how deeply rooted it is in our communities. And uh, it ties directly into the history you're talking about. And I started to bring a short film that I did down at the camp meetings. It's called Puddin' Pie. And when I, when I first moved down here, I called the fraternity brother and he said, what are you doing? I'm doing folk life documentaries. What are folk life documentaries? And I told him, and he said, well, you, you ever heard of pudding pot? And I said, no, never heard of it. <laughs> what is it? Well, you just have to come down to camp meeting and see. Well, what it is, is exactly what you're talking about. 
they slaughter a hog and they take the the uh, entrails from the hog and the ears and the head and they and they put it in a pot and start boiling it down and then they get it to a point where they pull the, the, the stuff out and then they they uh, these these are these are pieces of ear and tongue you know and wipes and so they put it over rice and that's what they feed the workers the workers stop at noon from the hard kid and what they do is that they will eat this this uh, <clears throat> this this uh, pig stuff <laughs> this called pudding pot and uh, and so I happened to be there when when they they invited all their friends to come eat this and so it was a great sort of feast and then what they do is they take that the, those parts and they, they chop them up and hash them up put them back in the pot and season it and they make hash out of that and they also take liver liver and make liver pudding and those other sort of dishes that come out of them. So it was interesting to hear your, your history because you know it, it's a very interesting history that is you know it comes out of the the hard labor of farmers. Mm -hmm. It comes out of the fact that you cannot have a hog killing unless your neighbors help you. It's just too much work. And so they congregate around this food. And so once this pudding pot was was made and they made hash from that, the hash became as important to the barbecue as the barbecue itself. They were wedded together. And the first the first hash restaurants in South Carolina were barbecue restaurants that served hash. The Dukes Brothers. And if you look at the Carolina hash documentary you'll see the whole history of the first beginning of when farmers supplemented their income by cooking barbecue and hash, selling it in little cinder block huts on the weekends to, to supplement their income. It got to be so popular, they gave up farming and started restaurants. And that's why South Carolina is popular with so many wonderful historic barbecue restaurants. The Midway is one of those.